Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this introduction to Prince2 webinar. I'm Andy West, and I'll be walking you through what Prince2 is and some other bits and pieces. So, first off, who am I? Um, I'm a seed trade consultant. I work for ILX Group. I have done since, well, since 2000. Um, as it says here, I've been a Prince2 trainer since 2000. So, just 21 years of this stuff. Um, I also cover another areas um, in terms of project management training and change management training as well. Um, I first encountered Prince2 in a previous role. I previously worked for a water company and one of the last projects I worked on at the water company was to identify and introduce a structured project management methodology to the organization so that we had one set of paperwork, one way of talking, one language, which may sound familiar to you. In terms of what am I going to cover today? I intend talking for about 45, 50 minutes, and we're going to cover things like what is Prince2? Uh, what does it consist of? What's it made up of? Um, a walk through some of the Prince2 elements. So what are they? What do they mean? And why are they important? And then to have a look at, if you want a Prince2 course, your delivery options, how you might do it, and some offers, and then we'll finish with questions and answers. Um, if you can save your questions for the end of the presentation, that would be great. If you can put your questions into the chat box, then my colleague will kind of collate those to make sure we've got a few questions at the end. Um, and if we go through all of those, then any other questions you can think of, drop them into the chat box and we'll try and deal with those as we go through. Okay, and I'll deal with all those questions right at the end. Um, this webinar is being recorded and you'll be sent a copy of it tomorrow. Um, we have your email addresses from your registration. And so a copy of this webinar will be sent out to you so you can share with your colleagues and watch again and pick up any details you didn't miss first time round. So that's what it's all about. Let's start then. Prince2, what on earth is it? It stands for Projects in Controlled Environments 2. It's an acronym. It's a framework, a methodology. It can be applied to any project with any output, any size, and any environment. It provides a core structure to manage your projects. Clearly, you might need to add some other elements, some technology, some local knowledge, the standards, the things that are important to your particular organization. But it provides that core framework. So Prince2 is not trying to do everything about project management. It's the start of a project management journey rather than the end of it. It is the most popular methodology across the world. It's been used in something like 120 countries, possibly more by now. I haven't seen all the details recently. It'd be applied anywhere. And that's the importance of it. It's just a kind of standard way that an organization can have its projects structured. And there's some things about that, how to make it work in that kind of environment. So what's it made up of? Prince2 says it addresses project management with four elements, principles, themes, processes, and the project environment. And that environment bit is going to be hugely important. Flexibility. Every project is unique, and therefore how you apply Prince2 has to be adapted to suit the needs of that particular project in that organization. So it's to understand those kind of elements and make it work for you. Principles, as it says here, basic obligations, good practice. If you take the theme of principles from Stephen Covey, he said the principles should be universal. They can be applied to every project. They're empowering. They give you something to do that makes some sense, that allows you to take some control over what's going on. And they're self-validating. When you do them, they'll make sense. They prove that they work. And this is true of the seven principles. I'll look at what they are in a bit. Seven themes, as it says here, the raw materials of project management knowledge. For any of you who've worked in projects already, you will have done some, if not all, of the seven themes. They are the common basic tools of project management. And then the processes, stepwise progression. It's a route map. How do I get from the start of a project to the end of the project. The purpose of the process map is to link the principles, what do you do, the themes, how do you do it, and the management documentation, the paperwork, the records. What do I write it down on to tell me what I've done so far and what I intend to do next? 
And so it integrates all of that information. As the note says here, flexibility. And I'll have a look at that in a second. What PRINCE2 doesn't cover is quite important. Specialist aspects. PRINCE2 can be used to manage any project in any technology. It can be used for both, if you like, traditional waterfall projects where the development happens in a series of key stages, you know, kind of specification, design, build, testing, launch, or agile, where things are built in an iterative, incremental way. PRINCE2 just talks about the management structure. How do you manage this? Not how are things built? That's what you have to add in. It can be used for um, finance-driven projects, for IT projects, construction projects. It's been used in all of those fields as we go through. It's about adding that technical specialist knowledge. What are we building? How are we going to build it? How are we going to test it? You need to bring those things in. Detailed techniques. PRINCE2 offers a couple of techniques, but actually says that it's not there's no defined set of techniques. What you need to find is appropriate techniques. So when we start to look at things like planning, there is a suggested planning technique, defining and analyzing products, four steps in it. But scheduling techniques, estimating techniques, all of those things are not part of PRINCE2. What it suggests is you need to go and find these, you know, pick up some standard ones. And there are lots of good techniques out there, similarly for things like risk identification, investment appraisal. So PRINCE2 does make some suggestions of these, but doesn't mandate any of them. What's appropriate in your organization? What sort of things are appropriate? What sort of tools and techniques do you like to use? And finally, leadership advice. Prince2 doesn't actually look at leadership, team development, and all those other kind of aspects. Um, so things like, you know, present this to your project board, the owners of the project, and they will approve it. Of course, in your organization, it might depend on how you present things to your project board about whether they'll approve it or not. So you have to add these other things. It can provide this core structure and you have to add these other elements to make it work, to bring it to life, to make it work in your environment for your projects. So this is not one size fits all. This is not, let's just pick up the PRINCE2 manual, which only you've seen it, is quite a good thing. I mean, it's just a small tome. It's about tailoring. It's about making it appropriate. What's the right size? If you have a small project with low risk, you might have a very light touch of prints too. If you have a big, scary, daunting project, you might require a lot more. What prints too does suggest is you're trying to avoid the two extremes, which are called robotic project management, where you take everything out of the prints too manual and you throw it at your projects, regardless of how large they are and how risky they are, which of course is overly bureaucratic, very slow, and everybody will hate. Or heroic project management, where you use nothing out of PRINCE2 and rush from crisis to crisis, kind of putting out fires, hoping things are going to work. Somewhere in the middle is an appropriate balance for your project. And that's really what we're looking at here, is trying to get that appropriate balance so that the project is controlled. And what it means is you have a controlled start, controlled progress, and a controlled close. Projects in a controlled environment. So that's what we're going to try and do. Now, the one thing about this that has been seen in the past was that organizations adopted PRINCE2 and say, we're going to use PRINCE2. And what they actually got is kind of Pino or PRINCE in name only. We say we're using PRINCE2, but we're not actually using very much of it or any of it at all. So what the PRINCE2 manual does suggest is that there are some minimum requirements. If you're going to run a PRINCE2 project, then you have to do certain bits of it. So you must be doing to the seven principles to show that you're doing those kind of minimum requirements. For each of the themes, there are some minimum requirements, which are generally about, you know, have I got enough to control the elements of a smallest project? So for example, for risk, you must have some kind of agreed risk management procedure, which should be documented. You should have some kind of risk register, somewhere to write down all of your risks. And you should follow the process that you've identified for yourself. And you should get better at it by using lessons as you go through. And all of the themes have something similar to that to make sure that there is a minimum amount of those basic tools of project management. You can't avoid any of them. It says you should have some per processes that satisfy the purpose and objectives of the PRINCE2 processes. So you don't have to use the PRINCE2 processes exactly as they are, but you need a controlled start and a controlled progress and a controlled close. It's making sure you have something in place that does that. 
And you should be using the recommended techniques or alternative equivalent ones, maybe techniques that your organization prefers. So it doesn't force you to do a huge amount. The principles, a little bit of the themes. You can have your own process model. You can have your own techniques, still Prince 2, because it has the basic structure. And the important thing, of course, is the telling of this as you go in. So at the start of the project, have you planned how you're going to do this as we go through? So those are the elements. That's what Prince 2 is really talking about. So let's have a look at some of the elements then. Let's have a look at some bits of Prince 2. We'll start with the principles. So Prince 2 is principle-based rather than prescriptive, as I've said, and it meets these things. The principle is universal, self validating and empowering. Essentially, the importance of these is to give you some basic elements of your project that make sense, that allow you to structure the project. Continue business justification. Why are you doing this project? What's the value of this project? If there isn't a justification, then don't start it. If there is, then start it. But look at it again. Is it still worthwhile doing? What we're trying to check here is that the benefits of doing this change outweigh the cost and risk of doing so. If we put this in organizational terms, you don't have unlimited resources in your organization. If you're spending those resources on something that doesn't add value, essentially it's a waste of those resources. And so it's making sure that there is some value in what you're going to do. The benefits outweigh the cost and risk. It may be that your project starts with, we think this is a good idea. And part of your project should be to prove that it is a good idea. If it doesn't, then to close it before you waste any more money on it. Learn from experience. Well, sounds like a nice idea. Let's get better. Let's not make the same mistakes this time as we did last time. So it encourages things like evaluations, reviews, putting things onto a lesson log and then applying as you go through the project. And at the end of the project, sharing that information with everybody else, the other project managers in your organization. The Chartered Institute for Personnel Development identified 15, 16 years ago that this century is going to be about knowledge, about sharing knowledge effectively. There are lots of tools and techniques and all sorts of wonderful social media things. But importantly, the challenge for organizations is keeping the knowledge. In the last century, it was quite normal for people to kind of start with an organization and stay there for their entire career. Not anymore. People come in, do four or five years, move on, taking all the knowledge that they've gained with them. If we don't do something about tapping into that, we might suddenly find we can't do something that we could do last week. And so learn from experience is about sharing that knowledge, making it available to other project managers so they don't have to make the same mistakes as you do. Define roles and responsibilities. This meets with the kind of temporary nature of a project. It has a start, a middle and an end. When you work for an organization, you will have a job title and a contract that says this is what you're employed to do. Your role in the project might be quite different to what your contract says, it might be quite different to what you know, your job title is. Do you understand what that role is? If you're the project manager, have you explained to people what their role is and what they're expected to do? What are their responsibilities? Who do they report to? Your job title might be project manager. But if it's not your project, if you're doing a project for a major client, you may just be a team manager in their much bigger project. Where do you fit? Do you understand it? Managed by stages. Essentially what we're talking about here is breaking the project into manageable chunks. It's like the, the, the old analogy, how do you eat an elephant? Well, bite-sized pieces. One swallow is a bit difficult. The important thing about stages is they're reviews for the owners of the project. The project boards, they're called in Prince 2 terms, which means they can go back and check justification. Is this still worth doing? As a project manager, can we learn from experience? Can we do the next stage better than the last one? And do I need to change the roles and responsibilities? Are we having a different structure? Are there different things being done, depending on the nature of the project? But it allows us to review all those things as we go through. So importantly, it's a review for the owners, the project board. It also helps you planning. Rather than try and plan the entire project in detail, Prince 2 says is we'll have a high level project plan, but we plan each stage. <clears throat> and so we plan just in time for the piece of the things we're gonna, gonna go and do. Which means we don't try and plan too far ahead. <coughs> Excuse me, managed by exception. Now this is kind of important, particularly if you work in an agile environment. This is about delegating authority, empowering people to make sure that when you delegate work, 
you are not micromanaging. You're not kind of peering over the shoulder, telling everything what to do. Prince 2 is never really like this. And it's kind of important because it allows is that when you delegate, you delegate some authority, some freedom to make decisions, to do the day to day, to solve small problems. And they only escalate to you as the project manager if it can't be resolved in those, which works brilliantly when you're trying to delegate to an agile team. As an agile team doesn't want you in there getting over their shoulder they might want to help setting this up making sure they've got all the right things to do the work but they're going to be a self-organized team and so imagine by exception is about empowerment similarly the owners the project board should manage by exception when they delegate a stage to you as the project manager do they give you some authority to run the stage so you can manage lots of the day-to-day -day issues problems things that come up without immediately reporting to them you still do the routine reporting keep them in the loop but you only need to escalate if it's going beyond the authority that they've delegated. It means our senior managers are not getting involved in things which are way below their pay grade. They're managed appropriately. One of the advantages of managed by exception is the appropriate use of expensive resources. Your senior managers are very expensive. Let's just use them for the decision making. As a project manager, you're probably a little bit cheaper, so you'll be used a bit more. Your team managers, hopefully, are cheaper still. We'll use them a lot more. Managed by exception. To focus on the product, what is the endpoint? What are we delivering? What is this project expected to deliver? Has it been clearly defined? Do we know what we're going to do? And we can do this both at the high level of the project and at the detail level, so that when we delegate work, there's a clear expectation of what's going to be delivered. Doesn't mean we can't do change. We'll talk about those things later on. But importantly, it allows us to kind of go, have I actually finished? If we run a test, have we delivered what was asked for? And that becomes much easier to sort. If I give you a strange example, if we know the task is bricklaying, how much bricklaying should we do? Let's define the length, height, width of the wall. And based on that, we can probably estimate how much work is necessary to do so. It allows us to see really what we're going to do, focus on the products. And then as a repeat, that is through the project environment. How big should our team be? How many stages do we need? How much authority is being delegated when we manage by exception? All of these things are about tailoring, particularly tailoring looks at things like risk. How risky is this? If it's low risk, we might have quite a light touch of control. If it's a very risky, daunting project, we might require a lot more control. And it's looking at all the elements that come in that allow us to understand what's going on. The principles should just be applied. But particularly, we're going to tailor the themes and the process model. Let's walk through the themes. <clears throat> these are the basic tools of project management so for any of you in the audience assuming you've been working in project management or you've seen projects going along these seven themes should not be a great surprise to you they're the things all project managers need to do as a basic there are other things you need to pick up as well but we have some basics here business case links back into the idea of business justification organization is about the roles and responsibilities quality is about focusing on the product as is plans to ensure we are delivering the right things in the right order. Risk is about managing the uncertainty. Because a project is about doing something new, something significantly different, there is always uncertainty. And therefore, how do we manage that uncertainty? Theme of change. Now, this is not about change as being delivered by a project. This is about change control. This is about changing things in the life of the project. And essentially, the view here is change is inevitable. Once your customer, your users have defined their requirements, they're in the process of changing their mind. And so what you need is an appropriate mechanism to capture, analyze, and approve or reject those changes to make sure they're being done in an appropriate way. And finally, progress. Where are we? Where are we going? Should we carry on? The monitoring control processes you expect to see in a project. So those are the themes. Let me look at them in a little bit more detail, just to give you a bit more kind of flavor of Prince 2 and some of the basic tools. In terms of the business case, Prince2 suggests there are two things. The business case, which justifies the project, and the benefits management approach, which looks at how you actually measure the benefits and what you're measuring them against. So the benefits are the measurable improvement of a particular project. And there'll be forecast at the very start of the project in an outline business case of, what's the value of doing this? What do we think will come out of it? We will refine that, becomes a detailed business case. And that's part of the definition of the project. This is why we're doing it. And based on that outline, 
do we want to start the project based on the detail? Do we want to start the technical work of the project? And notice, updated business case, should we carry on investing in this project? So at the end of each stage, we update this business case and make sure that it's still a worthwhile exercise. And the benefits management approach, essentially a set of instructions on when to and how to measure the benefits of this particular project to make sure that there is some kind of value in what we're doing and that we can actually show afterwards what that value was. This can be particularly important if you're spending other people's money. You know, what's the value? If you say, oh, it's going to make things better, then the question is always, how much better? By measuring and reporting on the benefits, you can show the difference you've made. This is what's actually happened. And so it's important we have that kind of commitment and control as we go through. Is this a worthwhile project? And can I show it was worthwhile? The organization structure, roles, responsibilities. Um, if you look at the slide in front of you, you'll notice that kind of purple box. That's essentially the roles that Prince2 suggests. And these are the roles to help manage the project. So we have a project board who own the project, who represent the various views of the, the project stakeholders. So the users, if you like the targets, the people who are going to use the product when it's finished. The suppliers, the people who are doing the work. It could be an internal organization or an external contractor. And the executive who represents what's called the business interest. Is this a worthwhile investment? We have the project manager running the day-to-day -day and reporting with them, team managers running various sections. Assurance is an audit function, support is the kind of administration to help the project manager and change authority, who has the authority for change. What Prince2 says about these roles is that they all need to be fulfilled. But on a small project, one person might have more than one role. So we might have someone who's both the executive and the senior user, and the project board are also doing project assurance and change authority. It's not worth having anybody else. The project manager is also the team manager and is doing project support, the administration of the project. And so we can have a very small management team for a very small project. Or if it's a very large project, we might have a lot of more people. So you can have more than one person doing the same role if it's appropriate. There are two roles that are going to have one person, the executive, the ultimate owner of the project, and the project manager, the person who's managing the day-to-day -day and bringing it all together. But beyond that, it's what's appropriate. What are the needs of the project? And this comes back into tailoring to make it work. Let's not throw lots and lots of management at a project that doesn't require it. Let's put the appropriate management in place for projects that do. Um, one thing I should just say before I move on is that the project board, its purpose is decision making. Although there are three roles, there's only ever one executive, you can have multiple senior users and multiple senior suppliers. Of course, if you put too many people onto your project board, there are too many users and too many suppliers, you might find that decision-making is slightly flawed. So with a project board, always try and keep it as small as possible. Have I got the right people up there who can represent all the views of the users and represent the views of the suppliers and make decisions effectively? If the answer is yes, that's much better. In terms of quality, quality is about capturing the customer's requirements and on the diagram here, it does this from the customer. What have we got to deliver in order to gain acceptance? And we do this right at the start of the project. It's on something called the project product description. The expectations are what the customer wants. Fast, shiny, reliable. The acceptance criteria are a measurable definition of those. So there's a clear end of this project was finished if you've achieved those things. And so the purpose is to understand what it is and then define, well, how am I going to do it? How do I work that way? We will break the final output of the project into its components, and each of those will be described. So we build the components, and the idea is we add them all together, we hit the project at the end. I've delivered what the project actually asked for. The quality management approach is written to describe how you're going to do this. If you've got to deliver the perfect solution that's what the project product description says they want perfect nothing less but the quality management approach would say well they want perfect there'll be lots of testing there'll be lots of audit there will be lots of double checking and lots of paperwork as an audit trail your project will be quite long and probably quite expensive if they want a temporary fix by thursday of next week then the quality management approach says well don't do very much testing let's get it done quickly as possible and we'll see if we've got the right thing at the end 
it's about appropriateness. What will help you achieve the quality expected by the customer in this particular project? The last element to help us manage quality is something called a quality register, which is basically an audit trail and contains details of all the quality activities undertaken during the life of the project. So when were things planned to be tested? When were they tested? Did they pass or fail the test? When are you going to be audited? When do they come in? Did you pass or fail the audit? And what have you done since? And so give kind of uh, an easy way to actually prove to the owners of the project, the project board, I've done what you asked. Look, everything's been signed off. We've passed all the appropriate audits or we fixed them if we had to. That's all about quality, making sure that you've achieved what is fit for purpose. In terms of plans, I've kind of given this one away already. What Prince 2 suggests is there are different levels of plan. Project stage team. The project plan is a high level view. It allows you to communicate to the senior managers, the project board, what the entire project is about, when it's going to be reviewed, the ends of stages, when's it going to finish, and roughly what's being done in each stage. The stage plan then becomes the project manager's day-to-day -day control document you manage by stages and each stage will have a plan produced towards the end of the previous stage so you can see what's going into it. Prince 2 suggests that the minimum number of stages in a project is two. Initiation, which is a planning stage, and then everything else, which is where we do all the technical work. We also talk about team plans. These are plans produced by the team for the team on how to build the products. So within a stage, what Prince does actually break this into what's called a work package. A work package is just a piece of work being delegated and agreed with the team. And importantly, it's about the commitment. So the team produces a team plan to show how long it's going to take and how much it's going to cost. And the project manager requires the commitment, the agreement for the team to delegate that work. And each of those will then be used. So in a stage, there can be multiple team plans. It's about the detail of the work being done. There's one more plan mentioned on here. It's the exception plan. The exception plan is a replacement if things don't go to plan. And it's particularly used at stage and project level if things go awry. Essentially, it's a replacement. Where there's been a major problem or issue, we can't follow the current plan because we're so far off track. The exception plan is how do I get from the problem to get back on track? A replacement. Notice this is necessary. Importantly, your projects don't have to go wrong. But if they do, use exception plans to get them back on track. Part of planning is to consider the uncertainty, risk. There are always risks in projects. And so the important element here is to identify the risks and to define them carefully, which Prince 2 suggests there's a kind of minimum information about those. Of course, what are we doing? Event, what's the uncertainty? What could happen? Effect, how does it affect the project? And if we have a well-defined risk, then building into the plan appropriate countermeasures, mitigation actions. Prince 2 just calls them responses. Importantly, risks can be both positive and negative. Threats, opportunities, and we manage them in the same way. What we're trying to do, essentially, is by minimising the threats, maximising the opportunities, is improving the ability of the project to succeed, to improve our chances of success, have I managed that uncertainty? And Prince to again suggest managed by stages. So as we do this, we might focus on the risks of this particular stage and then focus on the risks of the next one. Some might actually happen through a number of stages, in which case we keep an arm all the way through. It's making sure that we control them in an appropriate way. A link to that is our inevitable changes. There will always be change. Some of the change will be driven by things happening outside of your environment. Changes in technology, changes in legislation, changes in regulation. But your users will often change their mind. In fact, will often change their mind. Quite often, when you hand things over, they can look at it and say, I know that's what I asked for, but now I've seen it. I've had a great idea. Can you just? These are requests for change. These are changes to what was asked for originally. And so it's about analysing those. How long will it take? How much will it cost? Can we do this? Is it worthwhile? Does it add some value to the project? Yes or no goes through. 
if you work in a Prince2 Agile environment, then those sorts of changes can even be made at the team level. As part of a sprint or a time box, you may be able to make changes in there to improve the product you're working on. If it's too big for your sprint, then you would escalate to the project manager who go through the same kind of process. I know specification is a failure in the build process where what's been built doesn't meet the requirements. And therefore we have the choice of do we insist on rebuilding it to the standard and maybe delaying the project or accepting it as it is with lower quality. And again, the analysis will go, is this a good idea or a bad idea? Um, I do know of one of specification that was accepted without corrective action and actually wiped out the entire business case for the project that it was working on. Now, I'm not sure whether that was a poor decision made by the project board or a poor analysis done by the project manager, as I was merely one of the users on that particular project uh, and didn't get to see all the detail. And then other yeah, concerns, problems, things have happened. So remember, risks are things that may or may not happen. They have uncertainty. Issues are things that have happened and require management action. So if you weren't expecting it and legislation has changed, problem or concern, what does it do to your project? What's that mean? Someone's been off sick or is going to be off sick for some time. Very unlikely, of course, in the current environment. It's picking those things up. It's dealing with them. It's part of the manager's role to ensure that these are being managed on a regular basis throughout the life of the project. Finally, then. Progress. This links into managed by exception as a way of delegating work. And it says here, it's to establish mechanisms to monitor and compare actual achievements against plan and provide a forecast. Are we going to finish on time, on budget, scope to quality, all those sorts of elements? When work is delegated, if you notice here, it says the, the corporate program, the people outside the project will delegate authority for the project to the project board. The project board will then delegate stage to the project manager and the project manager will delegate work packages to a team manager. Whenever that delegation is going on, tolerances. And tolerance is an allowable deviation, a variation from plan. Remember, all plans are based on estimates. We never follow the plan exactly. If you had no tolerance, no allowable deviation, no authority, the moment you fall off the plan line, you would have to escalate to the next layer up. So team managers would be escalating everything every day to the project manager, who'd be escalating everything to the project board, who'd be escalating everything to the organization above. Tolerances allow empowerment. They allow you to delegate work and make sure that the people doing the work or managing that layer have appropriate control over what's going on. And whenever we delegate work, there's always reporting. There's a routine reporting and then the exception reporting. So routine reporting, everything's fine. Time-driven reports. Exception reporting, things aren't very good. So from a team manager, it's often called a checkpoint report. Routine re progress. Things are going great. I'm going to finish on time to budget. An issue, I'm not, and I need your help to resolve it. Similarly, project manager to the project board, it's called a highlight report. It's the routine progress report sent during a stage. If you aren't going to achieve, deliver the, the stage within tolerances, then it's the exception report. Project board, I need you to make a decision. It's gone off, right? There are here's some ways of solving it. What do you want to go and do? And so it's about routine. Or escalation depending on what's going on so the routine reporting is time driven and the event driven ones are things that prompt actions to take place in prints too there are no regular meetings there's no monthly meeting you have to have with your project board that could be a highlight report event end of a stage we've reached the end of the stage do you want to authorize the next stage or exception during a stage things have not gone very well what would you like to do to get it back on track? Or would you like to close the project? So the routine reporting things are essentially those. And of course, if you're working on a small informal project, these time-driven controls, these checkpoints and highlight reports could be a conversation. It could be a couple of um, slides that you send them to show what's going on. It could be a picture of a diagram on a wall, a balanced scorecard, rag reporting. It's routine control. It allows people to see very quickly what's going on, what isn't. Those are the themes. Those are the basic tools. And what Prince2 says is all projects require a minimum amount of these seven tools, these seven themes. 
So what are they? How are you going to use them in your particular project? A light touch or a lot? It may be a relatively short project, two stages, but has lots and lots of risk, in which case you might have a much more thorough <coughs> um, risk management structure. It may well be as you go in that the customer is very unsure about what they want, and therefore you might have to evolve quality as you go through from this is what we understand to actually we've learned more as we go through. And you might therefore need a very effective and rapid change control process to make sure you can deal with any changes and suggestions as you go through. What's appropriate? Each of the theme chapters in the Prince2 manual offers some guidance on tailoring, how you might use these in different circumstances, things to consider when making them work in your particular project. Last element of Prince2 to look at then is the process model. And as I said before, start, middle, and end. This is how we're going to make it work. This is the process model as indicated in the Prince2 manual. Seven processes. Let's break them down for you. At the top, in the directing layer, we have directing a project, oddly. This is a process for the project board, the owners of the project. It's triggered whenever a decision is needed. So it starts at the very start of the project and will run through to the very end of the project until the agreed closure. And so the project manager will go will escalate up there whenever a decision is needed. At the bottom, in the delivering one, we have managing product delivery. This is the process for the team, for the people doing the work. It's an assumed process. Prince2 manual does not talk about how they do the work. Essentially, they agree the work, they do the work, they hand it back. And there's the important thing, commitment, they agree the work. The project manager doesn't tell, doesn't instruct, doesn't command, they agree. And so they might authorize, but the team have to accept. It's making sure that it works in that particular way. Controlled start. There are two processes for the project manager which help us with the controlled start. Starting up a project, which you've noticed from the diagram, is pre-project preparation. It's a quick check. Is there a worthwhile project? Should we spend any real money on this? The only two roles really involved in this are the executive, and the project manager. They will design the rest of the team and the project manager will be going talking to lots of those potential team members. But it's a quick check. The manual actually says spend the minimum amount of time you can here. It produces something called the project brief and a stage plan for the first stage initiation, which goes up to the project board and directing and says, do you want to start the project? Do you want to authorize initiation? And if they say no, then the project never existed. It's not worth doing. It's not worthwhile. Let's not waste any real time and money on it. If yes, it looks worthwhile, then the initiation stage is the first stage of the project. And there are two processes here, initiating a project and managing stage boundaries. Initiating a project essentially is where we plan the project in a bit more detail. We're gonna produce something what Prince Tool calls the project initiation documentation. You may call it a project management plan or a project execution plan or a project delivery document. There are lots of variations I've bumped into. But the purpose essentially is to define how you're gonna do those seven themes for the rest of the project. How am I going to plan? Is there a business case? How am I going to manage risk? How do I manage quality? How do I manage change? How do I manage progress? All of those things go in the project initiation documentation, the PID. And that's going to go up to the project board in direct to go, will you authorize this? Is this right? Is this how you want me to manage the project? And hopefully they'll say yes. But in order to close this particular stage, what you also need is a stage plan for the next stage. The process managing stage boundary is used at the end of every stage except the last one. And its purpose is to plan the next stage and to report on what you did in the current stage. So it kind of looks forwards, next stage plan, and backwards, and then stage reports. And it updates the key information about the project, the business case, and the project plan. So it shows the project board, A, it's still worthwhile doing this, and where are we in the project as a whole? This will go up to the project board. Will you authorize the next stage? Will you give us the money for the next stage? And if the business case doesn't look good, the answer is no. If it looks good, then they commit to the next stage. A subsequent stage then, a normal stage in a project. Controlling a stage of the day-to-day -day work of the project manager. And essentially you're gonna delegate work to the team and get their agreement. And they'll trigger managing product delivery. They agree the work, they do the work, they hand it back. As it comes back, you'll then check where are we? And you might then delegate the next work package. So in a stage, there can be multiple work packages. Work out, work in progress, work back. You'd also do the routine reporting to the project board. 
to keep them informed about what's going on. You'll capture risks, issues, and deal with them. And if you can't deal with them, you'll escalate them to the board and they'll make some decisions. And so controlling a stage is where the project manager spends most of their working life, using the controls, the mechanisms you defined in the project initiation documentation. And as you come towards the end of the stage, you look up and go, I'm running out of stage. I'd better use managing a stage boundary. When you plan the next stage, do the end stage report, update the information, you go to the project board and go, would you like to authorise the next stage? And if they say yes, then the whole thing repeats. And that subsequent stage can repeat as many times as you have stages. As I said before, the minimum number of stages is two, initiation and everything else. So notice that in the final stage, we have controlling stage and managing product delivery. And then we finally have closing a project. So rather than planning the next stage, we are essentially closing the project down. So it's work out, work back, work out, work back, keeping the reporting, and rather than closing it, then closing it. And the manual says a number of times that closing a project is a process. It's not a separate stage. But doesn't it ever really explain this. And the important thing here is if controlling a stage, or sorry, closing a project were a separate stage, then you've done all the technical work in controlling stage and managing product delivery. And the final stage just becomes kind of paperwork, admin. And of course, the temptation here could be is I've got something important to move you on to. Don't worry about closing a project now. We'll come back and do it later. And of course, you know what's going to happen is that having disbanded the team, you'll never come back and close the project properly. You'll never learn lessons. You'll never do the evaluation. The paperwork will never be tidied up. And you end up with hundreds of unclosed projects lurking around the organization, which could mean if you have project codes, lots of budget codes that haven't been closed properly that you could charge things to, which may not be a good thing if it's got your name against it. And so closing a project is part of the last stage. It's checking that what you've delivered has been accepted. You've met the requirements uh, of the project, that you've done the evaluation, you've identified lessons, particularly the ones you've done all the way through to share with other people. Views with hindsight, what worked, what didn't. And it's then a matter of getting agreement. So the file goes up to the project board and go, will you authorize closure? So the project board in directing will say, yes, let's start the project. And then right at the very end, yes, you finished the project. And we share that information with. So for the project manager, the controlled start is starting up and then initiating. A quick check, proper definition. Control progress is controlling a stage and managing a stage boundary. Running the data of this stage and planning the next one. And control close is, of course, closing a project. Making sure that all the loose ends are tied up. Any outstanding work has been passed on to somebody else. That's all been dealt with as we go through. And there we have the PRINCE2 process model as a quick overview. So why? Why might you want PRINCE2, either for you or for your organization? As a project manager, what does it give you? It gives you a structure, framework, something to pin your project on. So you're not just kind of running from crisis to crisis. It gives you something to plan, something to think about. There are some, essentially some things you can use. There's a, um, a health check. The things you can actually look at, have I done these things? Does it make sense? Do I need to do it this time round? It links into best practice. As I said at the start, I've been looking at Prince 2 since before 2000. I'm on my fourth, fifth version of the manual. It evolves. As we learn more as a project management community, Prince 2 evolves. We're currently on Prince 2 2017. It will be updated as we learn more, as we get better. And of course, Knowing that you're doing things which are linked to best practice, that you've got a way of checking you're doing the right kind of things, gives you confidence as a project manager. I can go in and plan this project because I've got some sense of what I'm going to go and do. Prince 2 will give you a set of documents to use to make sure they work for your organization. So you can actually say, these are the thoughts that we talk about. It works whether you're working on traditional projects, you know, kind of a waterfall approach, or agile projects. You can use Prince 2 as a management tool. It's not about doing the technology. Prince2 doesn't look at those things. It's to help you as a project manager manage and make sure it has the appropriate control above you. Why do organizations like Prince2? Why is it the most popular methodology? Well, consistency. In the water company I worked for before I worked for ILX, we had something like 300 people running projects, all of whom had their own paperwork and their own process and their own language. 
even in engineering, where we had, you know, 150 engineers running different projects, there are 150 different versions of the paperwork. And oddly, the director of engineering was one of those people going, can I just have one, one standard set of paperwork so I can see what's going on, I can read it and understand it. And of course, that consistency allows people to understand what's going on. Where do I look for the information? What do I look for? Which means that they understand it quicker, they can communicate more effectively. It also means you can transfer lessons from one project to another much more effectively. You're using the same structure. Therefore, the hints and tips from other project managers should be scalable, tailable into your own project. It gives standardized reporting so that your senior managers and even your organization might be able to look at what's going on. How are we doing in terms of progress? Have I got that clear understanding? Are my projects under control? And tailoring, scalability. This is not one size fits all. The biggest complaint about Prince2, you'll always hear is, look at the size of that manual. Isn't that bureaucratic? Which tells you they haven't looked at principle number seven, tailored to the project environment, and the guidance in the whole of the manual about how you might use this. What's about, what do I need to do? How do I do it? How do I scale this? And there are differences if you are on the supplier side or the customer side, it gives you different variations. If you work in a commercial environment, you are the customer, you have an external supplier. You might find that there's two sets of information. There's different ways of reporting. It suggests things to help it work for you. As I said at the start, Prince2 doesn't do everything. It doesn't do specialist techniques. It doesn't do the techniques. It doesn't do leadership things. So Prince2 is project management, but project management isn't Prince2. This can be a starting point for you, some structure, an understanding of how to run a project. And then you can build in skills about the techniques, the leadership, negotiation, the soft skills, all the other things that you might need as an effective project manager. This is just a framework to help you show you have those other skills. So that's Prince2. As a training organization, there's gotta be a pitch. Here's the pitch. How would you like to learn about Prince2? There are a number of ways you can actually do this. Online. We have some award-winning online courses covering both the foundation and practitioner. So you can actually get a license for those with exams if you wish, um, normally we send them, and study online in a time scale that suits you. The licenses last up to a year and they allow you to work through and prepare you for both the foundation and the practitioner exams. If you don't fancy doing it by yourself, how about a virtual course? Essentially, join some others, have a trainer like me, to walk you through the foundation practitioner in the comfort of your own office or your own home, depending on where you are at the moment. This very much follows the same structure as the classroom one. It's a five day course at three days of foundation, two days of practitioner. You don't have to do both in the same week. You could do the foundation and come back and do the practitioner later on. How about a blended one? Take the online course, do the foundation, but then join in the virtual course to prepare a practitioner, to talk to other people, to ask your questions. Importantly, if you are doing the blended and online, you have our support. There is always a help email address, a tutor support email address, where you can send in a question and someone like me, my colleagues, will contact you to answer your query, either email or via some kind of phone call, Teams meeting, Zoom meeting, what is the best way of talking to you? These are your options. So, for listening today, you get a reward. If you want to book some courses from us, there are some discounts available using these codes, using the code here today. Um, if it's an e-learn course, an online course, 30% off. Virtual blended, 20% off. If it's the classroom one, when we get back in the classroom, 15% off. Um, those are being looked at for the future. So you better grab that code. And then you would actually go onto ilexgroup.com or prince2.com and you can have a look at our courses and book.